Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another edition of our Sunday Humanist Lecture Series with the Humanist Association of San Diego. We not only bring you wonderful speakers, great thinkers, incredible activists, and we introduce you to subjects and topics that you should know that you typically don't hear about. But we're not merely a meetup group. We're not merely a YouTube channel. We are also a community. And I want to recognize a few people who are no longer with us. In humanism, we don't believe necessarily. Some religious humanists might, but the, most, the majority of us don't believe in an afterlife. And we believe that we live on in the fond memories of, of other people who live on beyond us. And there are three people that I want to mention today. Of course, there's James Randi. The amazing Randi died this week at 92 years of age. I had the pleasure of meeting James Randi about 10 years ago. I got to interview him at the amazing meeting. It, he, was, it, he was amazing. He lived up to his title. A couple of things I remembered from him were the fact that he had just come out of the closet as a gay man at 82 years of age. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Randy, after 82 years, you come out as an octogenarian. And he said, no, I didn't. I didn't come out as an octogenarian. I came out as gay. And I also, I also asked about his, his career in magic. And there's one thing that he said that I found profoundly moving and it stuck with me and it demonstrated how, how, how strongly moral he was. Back in the 1950s, when he was performing escapism from straight jackets, from blocks of ice, he was traveling around the country. He was based out of New York City. He had a writer in his contract that Mr. Randy will not perform in front of segregated audiences. He took a bus down to Florida from New York City. He looked out from the wings at the theater that he was about to perform in. The floor was lily white and he saw nothing but dark faces up in the balcony. What Mr. Randy did is he went, packed up his suitcase, left the theater, got on a bus for the long trip back to New York. That's powerful. It's an example that we should all follow. Mr. Randy didn't perform in front of segregated audiences. He had that strong moral drive that led him to go from simple, simple acts of magic to entertain to go and debunk charlatans like Yuri Geller. And there was, sort of, there was an Onion article the other day that said, Psychic is getting sick of James Randi's ghost frequently trying to debunk her. <laughs> Additionally, outside of high profile people, one other person is no longer with us. One of our former group members who moved off to Michigan, unfortunately, Jamin Chesney is no longer with us. He died the other day at 40 years of age. There's one other death that I, I feel that we should mention. It didn't happen this last week. It happened the week before. This is relevant to what we're talking today, about today. A history teacher in France by the name of Samuel Platy, died at 47 years of age. Samuel Platy not only died at 47 years of age, he was brutally assassinated. Why was he brutally assassinated? He was talking about current events in France. Five years ago, at the Charlie Hebdo offices, the start of three days of terror began. In those three days of terror, 20 people would lose their lives and 22 others would be injured. At the start of the three days in Paris, in terror that started in Paris, 12 people at the Charlie Hebdo offices were murdered, 11 others were injured. And why? Because they posted cartoons. Charlie Hebdo is provocative. That's the point of Charlie Hebdo. 
Charlie Hebdo published some cartoons of Mohammed. And members and affiliates of Al Qaeda killed them. A sociologist at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, Farhad Kashrakovar, said, I feel like it's very hard to use these cartoons for strictly educational purposes. Samuel Platy had shown the cartoons in his, in his middle school class. Secularists think that it's their right because of the law that allows blasphemy in any form of mockery of religion. But on the other hand, there is the feeling that in doing so, it is the Muslims who are despised, not the prophet. By using cartoons to teach, by using cartoons to teach freedom of expression, we do not understand that we offend people. There are 2,000 ways to express freedom of expression, so why choose this one? Why? Because it's history. And no teacher, no artist, no regular person on the street should be assassinated for pictures that they have either drawn or other people have drawn that they've shown. Blasphemy is a tool of a lone individual against a millennia of orthodoxy and repressive socio-political power wielded in the name of ineffable and unquestionable, of the ineffable and unquestionable. Blasphemy is our birthright. Blasphemy can and is a sacred act. In a eulogy from Mr. Platy at the Sorbonne, the French president Emmanuel Macron called him a quiet hero. And according to the Guardian, Teachers in France have vowed to teach difficult subjects after their colleagues murder. These are people who we should remember. We should remember the amazing Randy. We should remember Jamin Chesney. And we should remember Samuel Platy. Now on to atheism. We've seen a market rise in atheism across the world and across the United States. Those of us who were ascribed non-believers, atheists and agnostics went from 5% of the population according to Pew back in 2009 to 10% today. If you'd like to know more about this, there's a political scientist by the name of Ronald Inglehart who's coming out with a wonderful new book called Religion Sudden Decline, What's Causing It? and what comes next is coming out in January from Oxford University Press. And on to humanism. With humanism and religion, for humanism, God is a topic for another day. Humanists put God on the back burner and put the needs of human beings in an equitable and immediate manner where many of the problems that we have, have human-made problems, they're human-made problems and they require human-made solutions. My personal mantra for humanism has gone beyond specifically good without God, and it's now, we are humanists and we are here to help. Atheism itself is simply a lack of belief, and we have atheist humanists. In the past few weeks, we've heard from our humanistic Jewish friends, from Kahal Am. We understand that they're religious humanists in ethical culture, it, with our, our humanist Unitarian Universalist friends, our humanistic deist friends, their agnostic humanists. And then for most of us, we are atheist humanists. For those of us who are atheist humanists, of which I consider myself in that category, we are in fact, not only good without God, but in fact, we were good never needing God in the first place. There was a fantastic book that came out in 1981 called Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality by John Boswell. There have been a lot of parallels between homosexuality and atheism in terms of our greatest social obstacles and the fact that we typically as atheists don't come from atheist families and we have a drive towards visibility. What Boswell said in that book was the problem that a lot of gays and lesbians faced was that there weren't gay and lesbian Jewish grandmothers to tell the stories of the past. And we do have some stories of the past. We have the recent slate of books 
from, from the last 15 years from the Four Horsemen, Dawkins, Dennett, Harris, and Hitchens. But it's more than that. It's far, far more than that. We have a long history. There has been a long history of doubt, a long history of disbelief, a long history of atheism. It goes back quite a long time. There have been many waves of popular atheism throughout history. Oftentimes, atheism is used as a vehicle to challenge established social and ecclesiastical orders. Other times, atheism is a vehicle to challenge belief in superstition itself at an individual level. So today, we are going to hear about living what living, breathing, active atheists are doing to help people all around the globe. And then we have a special treat. While many of us don't have atheist grandmothers to tell us our stories, we have illustrious intellectuals dedicating their lives to pass on that needed narrative. So today, I have a few questions with one of my colleagues not only am I the president of the Humanist Association of San Diego, I'm also on the board of Atheist Alliance International and North American director. And I have one of my friends and colleagues, Michael Sherlock, our executive director of Atheist Alliance International, calling in from the future. Hello, Michael. Thank you for calling in from the future. How is Monday doing? Uh, Monday's not too bad. I've actually... I've got to rush my kids to school in about four minutes. So I guess we're going to have to try and jam pack this in in four minutes. But thank you so much for inviting me. And everything you were saying was amazing. Like um, your knowledge of humanism, of atheism, this group that you've put together. I mean, I, I think about 20 years back, 30 years back, mm -hmm. how scarce this movement was, uh, be it atheist, humanist, whatever you want to call it. But now look how much it's growing. And it's people like yourself, Jason, who are organizing and mobilizing people and everyone else here as well who, who are doing such a good, good job. And I just want to thank everyone here as well, especially for, I guess, you know, taking time out of your life to promote such, I guess, a worthy cause. And that is the right to be secular, the right to be a humanist or an atheist. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. And, and thank you for calling in from Tasmania and the work that you're doing. Michael is, is absolutely dedicated. He's incredibly passionate. He's leading our efforts. We, have, we sponsor a, a humanist primary school in Kasesi, Uganda. We have an atheist internet cafe in Democratic People's Republic of Congo. Additionally, we're doing things like we're sponsoring the legal support of people like Mubarak Bala, people accused of blasphemy, almost disappeared by their government. Other people have been condemned to death. And Michael, for all of our other groups in Southern California, I understand that you have to take your children to school quickly, but why should we become affiliate members of Atheist Alliance International? It's simple, we're stronger together. That's a fact. Yes, we've got peripheral differences in politics and leanings, um, but the most important thing is we all share some core values and that is the right to be secular, uh, equality for women, for LGBTQ members of that community, for, for everyone around the world, just to have the freedom of expression and the freedom of conscience as well. And to promote a more rational worldview that's based on science, and education rather than indoctrination. So uh, this month I've kicked off our affiliates meetings. Um, I've been meeting with everyone from Kenya to New York. It's been incredible and uh, Sri Lanka, just all over the world to hear the different struggles that different atheists and non-believers have around the world. And to start to find a way to, I guess, mobilize our efforts more globally. And recently our VP has just been invited to a UN conference where we'll, uh, he'll potentially discuss the right to be secular and these types of initiatives. So we are mobilizing at an increasingly uh, rapid rate. And I think everyone should come and join Atheist Alliance International, whether you call yourself an atheist or a humanist, together we are stronger. That, that's an absolute fact. Um, and so I'd say that's the main reason. And also let me just give a quick shout out to um, Tina Hamilton, who 
is doing amazing work as the, our outreach director for our Atheist Support Network. She helps everyone from large profile cases to people you haven't heard of uh, who are escaping death and, and uh, brutality and family violence uh, from Somalia to every, uh, all around the world, Saudi Arabia. She, she just works tirelessly in her team as well. So yeah, that, that's definitely a good reason to come and join us. And, and Michael steers the ship as the only international atheist group that has UN observer status. And participatory, right, participatory rights with the European Council as well. Uh, so we are working very hard. And I've actually got a meeting tomorrow with uh, Ayan Hersili's uh, executive director of her foundation. Uh, we've also brought in Nada, who is a woman, uh, or a woman now. She was a girl when she started the foundation that helps Yemeni girls escape child marriage and get them in education. Uh, she does fantastic work against, you know, female, female genital mutilation and all these. So we are really starting to look like a, a much more diverse atheism, atheism, I guess, when it first came out, I guess, well, what you might call new atheism. I don't like the term, but when it first came out, it was very much dominated by, I guess, white men. Um, let's just be honest, it was. Uh, it's now starting to get a lot more diverse, particularly with the influx of ex-Muslim atheists coming in. And I would like to give them more of a platform in atheism, uh, globally speaking as well. So I guess that's that's my kind of personal stance where I'd like to see it, Ed. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I'll let you take your kids to school now. Thank you for being here. Hopefully we see you again in the near future. Additionally, go to atheistalliance.org to learn more about the organization. Talk to me afterwards. My email is n.america for North America at atheistalliance.org. Uh, atheist and Michael, thank you for being here and thank you for all the hard work that you do. My pleasure. Please consider becoming a member. It really does help us help others. All right. I've got to get my kids to school. They're going to kill me. Thank you so much. See ya. For all of the groups in here, please consider becoming an affiliate member as an organization of Atheist Alliance International. What we can do is we can promote what you're doing. We do really great work around the planet. We don't talk about everyone that we're helping because of course, a lot of the times in these far flung places around the planet, if, if it came out who we're helping, it would put the family and other close contacts of these contacts of these particular people at risk. And so we do really good work and we're at the UN, we're international, we're here to help you. If you know the, the satirical musician, Tom Lehrer, Tom Lehrer has a song called Labachevsky. And I'd like to paraphrase Labachevsky. Who made me the atheist I am today? the humanist scholar that others all quote. Who's the professor that made me that way? The greatest that ever got chalk on his coat. One man deserves the credit, one man deserves the blame, and Dr. Joseph McKenna is his name. Dr. Joseph McKenna is here today to talk to us about the history of atheism. He was one of my mentors at UC Irvine. He helped cultivate my love of, of reading and becoming a voracious reader. He helped shape the way that I see atheism and free thought. He helped impart the history of free thought into me that I've used and I've taught other people. He's one of the most brilliant people that I've ever met. He has taught the history of religious ideas for 25 years, the last 20 at the University of California, Irvine. He has published He's been published in academic journals and in popular venues like the LA Times, Huffington Post. He has a channel on patheos.com called Humanist Plus. And he's written about 140 articles. He's created Upon Religion to feature numerous, feature numerous writing projects of his, such as The Pope's Last Confession, An Opinionated Dictionary of Religion, God, an autobiography of the missing years, and letters from the damned. He also created the YouTube channel Five Finger Freestyle Guitar for original guitar composition. His spouse is a longtime professor of medieval Japanese literature and theater at the University of California, Irvine, and they live together 
with their two daughters in Southern California. Can everyone please unmute themselves and give a warm San Diego welcome to my mentor, Dr. Joseph McKenna. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> okay, am I on? <laughs> mm -hmm. So Jason was, you know, he was a wonderful student. He was the kind of student who became a little bit of a, a moral exemplar to the other students in the room. We would have these, he was in several classes, we'd have these great, you know, classroom conversations. Jason was a great student when he was at UCI. He was a student that the other students looked up to, they wanted to hear what he had to say. He was very articulate in the room. He was um, uh, very engaging and very agreeable. And, uh, you know, as far as influencing him, I always tell my students when they go out hither and yon to their parents, their grandparents and so on and mention the class, I used to joke with them and don't mention my name. When you, when you talk about this stuff, okay? I don't want to have a call from grandma about, you know, what, what's the effects of um, you know, the lecture today or something like that. So let me, let, me, let me get into this. Now, I'm used to talking to 20 year olds. So that's what you're going to have to, you have to think of yourselves, you know, it's like, okay, this guy is used to talking to 20 year olds. I'm not really accustomed to talking through, to a room full of you know, intellectual peers who are really probably conversant in this topic. So I'm gonna, you know, do a low fly over this history of atheism. A lot of this stuff you know, but maybe some of it you don't. I can't get into all the details, many of which you know the various arguments against God and so on. Um, but I'm gonna do this sort of like low fly over the history of this topic, the history of atheism, or I think of it too as religious skepticism, right? So where do we start this history? When I began uh, teaching at UCI about 20 years ago, the chair of the department, we we're just talking about a course on offer that's in every history department in the country, right? World religion, I mean, uh, world history. So I asked him, it was Ken Pomerantz, who's a very famous scholar, went on to the University of Chicago. I said, where do you start the, where do you start world history? Where do you start that class? Or what period do you start? And he said, we start with the cooling of the earth's core. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. I thought that was one, wonderfully sort of whimsical and a little bit puckish. So I thought about that in terms of, you know, atheism. Where do you start? Let's start with the cooling of the Earth's core, right? Let's start, let's back it up. Let's start with the Big Bang, right? Where do you want to start this thing? The point is that what I would say about something like that that's whimsical, but the point would be that it's prehistoric and it was, in terms of humanity, the original condition of human beings, right? If you think about, if you go back to proto-humans and so on millions of years ago, these are people likely without these kind of beliefs. It would take a certain evolution of the brain, right? Just the evolution of the brain for homo sapiens, for, for people to, to come up with an idea like this of these, these invisible supernatural entities. So at what point that occurred, that's up to you know, other people to tell us, but we can say for perhaps millions of years or hundreds of thousands, a lack of belief in gods was the original state of humanity. But belief in the gods, right? That we know that's prehistoric too. The way we think we know this, <clears throat> excuse me, or think we know anything about prehistory, right? Because they didn't write anything down. That's the, that's the definition of history when people started writing stuff down. Before that, it's just, there's no writing. So how do we know anything about it? Well, we know about it through the physical remains of past cultures, right? The objects they leave behind, that's archeology. span And we look at an object and from the object, guess the mental state of the people that made the object. But the other way we think we have a window into prehistory is reports from travelers, explorers of isolated Aboriginal tribes. This can go back, you know, this can go back thousands of years or this can go back to 500 years when the Europeans started going around going around the world and finding peoples in little islands in the South Pacific, in, in South America, places like this where 
you know, we now learn that these people have been there for 20,000 years. So if you're seeing something they're doing from an isolated Aboriginal tribe, you may get a window into something that's older than history, which is only, what, 5,000 years old since they started writing things down. <clears throat> so you may be looking at stuff that's 7,000 years old, 10,000 years old, 20,000 years old. And so we see, we saw from these reports of the travelers that there was you know, widespread belief in many invisible entities, right? Uh, and the anthropologists of the 19th century coined the word animism for that. The animism, that everything is animated by some sort of a spirit that has a volition, like a human being, that's making the world work. Uh, the babbling brook, the, the, tr the wind in the trees, right? <clears throat> All of this stuff is animism and it produces innumerable Numerable or almost innumerable invisible entities that these people believe in, both benign and malevolent, right? And there was also, if we can believe these reports from the isolated tribes that were discovered 500 years ago in the Americas or wherever, some of them, a minority, but some, had no obvious religion or religious beliefs, right? So we can say that that sort of lack of, of belief in, in these invisible entities or lack of belief in God is prehistoric too. When we get to history, when we get to writing in cuneiform in, uh, in ancient Sumeria, modern day Iraq, uh, religion is in full flourish at the so-called dawn of history five 5,000 years ago. It's in full flourish. They've got temples, they're worshiping, they have requires that it's polytheism right it's polytheism right and it's that's everywhere in what we're talking about so the western world so that's five thousand years ago three thousand years ago somebody comes along and says look before this there's innumerable gods in all these invisible entities everything is worshipable then comes you know the persians and they say there's only two there's only two gods. There's a good one and there's a bad one, right? This sort of dualism is reduced to two. And this is where the devil idea comes from. And then about the same time, monotheism appears on the world stage, late to the world stage, the belief in one God, right? So that's maybe 3,000 years ago, but it's pretty, pretty deeply into history, right? Thousands of years of believing in many gods. All those gods, all those invisible entities that were in the polytheisms and in the animistic world of Aboriginal peoples, <laughs> note that they became these celestial spirits in the monotheistic heavens, in the dualistic heaven too, right? So they became angels or you know, they became other celestial spirits that, that are living, you know, with the one God in this other realm. So some would say that that exposes a very deep bias in the human psyche for polytheism, right? The fact that the monotheists can't even maintain it. They crowd their heavens with these other supernatural entities, right? So anyway, so this is we get into history, we've got widespread belief in gods, and then we get monotheism coming out of, you know, Israel, ancient Israel, the ancient Hebrews. Where does atheism show up? It shows up late too. So that's about 2,500 years ago in terms of documentary evidence. Now in terms of guesswork, we could guess it anywhere along in this story, in prehistoric peoples too. We already have some instances of lack of belief in God, but there could be individual cases of uh, incredulity, right? There could be somebody in the tribe who says, you know what, I don't think I believe a word of it. We just don't have any record of that, but we have a right to imagine. And indeed, maybe there is always a certain percentage of the human race that is, is less likely to believe these things. There might be, right? But in terms of the documentary evidence of atheism 2500 BCE, 2500 years ago, in places like India with the Buddha, right? He's raised Hindu with this, with this pantheon of gods and he rejects that. He doesn't, he doesn't assent to that. He leaves that behind. Possibly also Mahavira in India who starts Jainism 
which is a religion that if you know would really marginalize the gods that you know sort of that's it can almost, it's almost an atheistic religion too. You've got China, you've got Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu with Taoism, right? Who's changing, there's no personal God. There's this power in the universe, the Tao. That's not a personalistic God or anybody you pray to. Possibly Confucius also in China. But for our interest in the West, the history of atheism, you get it in the Greeks, right? 600 BC, 500 BC and following you get maybe 25 writers among the Greeks who express skeptical ideas, right? A religion that's immersed in religiosity, right? If we go to Greece today, we see the places in ruins, right? With, with all these altars to these gods that we know didn't exist, but they believed this stuff. They called it, uh, we call it mythology. They didn't, right? They didn't call it mythology. That took, you know, a certain amount of time to call that religion mythology. So you get these Greek skeptics. And then, of course, the Greek influence upon the Romans around the year 2000 or before, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 2000 years ago, around the time of Christ, you get the rise of Roman skepticism in 10 authors or so. And at this point, I'd just like to mention this book, Battling the Gods, Atheism in the Ancient World by Tim Whitmarsh came out in 2015. He's a professor at Cambridge University of, of, of uh, Greek culture, ancient Greek culture. And he wrote that book because he was tired of this notion of new atheism, that atheism was a new thing. And he says, what's it subtitled? Atheism in the Ancient World. And that's the book from which you can get you know, and get all of these different authors, um, um, all of these different writers, the ancient Greek writers, who expressed these skeptical ideas. Now, what I wanna say at this point is the Greeks and the Romans, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, so 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, they offer, and you, when you read this stuff, if you read his book, uh, Whitmarsh's book, you're gonna see that they offered what will become recurring themes in the atheistic analysis of theism, recurring themes. There's the first ones to think of it or put it in writing. And I'll mention some of these, like there are several of these Greek writers who appeal to natural explanations for, for nature, for natural phenomena and not supernatural uh, causes for things. Right, because everything, of course, in the ancient world was about the supernatural causes for things. For thousands of years, thousands, people thought a god in a chariot dragged the sun across the sky. Right, that's the supernatural explanation for the thing. And these guys and their men, uh, mostly men or all men, some of these are starting to offer natural explanations for the world. They would say, I don't think those those lights in the night sky are gods. I think they're gaseous orbs, like our sun, right? Give a natural explanation, but those were thought to be gods, right? And they might get into trouble for that. They might get accused of impiety. You can't say that those, that, that those are, are gods up there. Those are gods, right? But they start offering these natural explanations, even of disease, right? So when, it, when the penchant is to explain disease from these invisible entities. And then along come, you know, the Greek um, physicians saying, well, it's all natural causes for this stuff. So that's, that's one of the themes that perdures, right, to this very moment that lasts, that the atheist or the religious skeptic wants to say, I, I see natural causes for things. I don't see supernatural causes for things. The second thing that the ancient Greeks and Romans offered this lexicon in atheism was natural explanations, again, not supernatural, for the phenomenon of religion, for the rise of religion. Some of their writers started to think about this. Where did this come from? And they would say things like, <clears throat> well, it was ignorance of natural causes. This would be, this is gonna be repeated later in the enlightenment in the 1700s. Ignorance of natural causes leads people to suppose there are supernatural causes for, for things. 
I don't know how the sun goes across the sky, but I think there's a God pulling it in a chariot, right? And that becomes plausible to people. They didn't know the real reason for the illusion, right? Because the sun isn't moving at all. So they offered a supernatural reason. So they would say, ignorance is the beginning of religion. It's ignorance of natural causes. They would say, in terms of the rise of religion, a writer named Critias, maybe 600 BC, Greece, he's offering, he says, look, it's a form of social control. And we're gonna hear that again, right? In the history of the atheist or critique, he says, it's pretty funny what he said. He said, look, some wise men living, living thousands of years ago. Now this is a man who's living 2,600 years ago and he's imagining people living 2,600 years before him. Something to that effect. He says, wise men got together and they thought, look, we've created these laws for people, but people will break the law under the cloak of night or when they're alone. So says Critias, he says, so the wise men got together and they created the fear of the gods as the ultimate policeman, right? The gods who see everything you're doing, even when you are alone. And moreover, they can read your mind and they can punish you in some afterlife scenario or in this life they want. So Critias is thinking, it was invented, this gods were invented as a form of social, social control, right? The 24 seven surveillance of human beings. So that's 2,600 years ago, somebody offers that. Others, another one, Euhemerus, he says, the, the whole gods thing emerges from the deification of heroes. These were real people in some ancient times and they morphed into deities in some way, right? Uh, somebody else would say, well, what's happened, what happened was is, you know, these ancient peoples divinized aspects of nature, right? Water, fire, air, sky, and they turned those into gods, right? So you have Poseidon, Poseidon, water, Hephaestus for fire, Hera, the goddess for air, and Zeus for the god of the sky. So there's that theory. There's theories that they, they, they offered theories that um, human goods were divinized and then the creator of the goods. So wine is divinized and then Dionysius is divinized as the god of wine, the creator of wine, this sort of thing. And then there was another theory that religion began in fear. It just began in fear, right? It's not far off from what Critias is saying, but this is just sort of the kind of fear that confronts anybody in the natural world, you know, with disasters, with disease, accidents and stuff like that. And so this concept of religion. So they offer these two things, natural explanation for phenomena, phenomena, natural explanations for the rise of religion. And then there's other specific ideas and tactics as it were that the Greeks and the Romans started that still persisted in this whole history, right? So the critique against the anthropomorphic gods, the gods that are human, all too human, that they, they have the whole panoply of human emotions, even all the negative and unattractive stuff, right? Like jealousy and vindictiveness and pettiness, right? And so it was Xenophanes in antiquity. He says, look, if you put a pen in the, ha in the hand, in the, in the hoof of a horse, if the horse could draw, you say, draw, the, draw God for me. The horse would draw a horse, God. And so humans characterize or portray their God in their own image. This is gonna come later, right? With Feuerbach in the 19th century, right? The projection aspect. The anthropomorphic God says Xenophanes in an indirect way is incredible, that sort of thing. So that's, that's a perduring, a lasting critique. Famously, the problem of evil is raised by Epicurus. This is 300 BC. So he's the first one to bring it up for the idea of God, the problem of evil, which is the problem of suffering for the idea of a good and powerful God. It's a very potent problem for the idea of a certain kind of God, a God that's good and powerful. If he's strong and he's decent, why, does he, why doesn't he do anything about all the suffering that the animals and humans 
have to put up with this sort of thing. And, and, and Epicurus puts it this way. He says, if God wishes to prevent evil, he wants to do it. He wants to prevent it, but he cannot. Then God is not all powerful, right? But if he can prevent it, he has the power to do it and he will not, then he's not all good, right? And that becomes the nature of the problem. Reams of books are written on this, shelves and shelves of books where theists have to basically defend those predicates, the good and powerful God against the evidence of a suffering world. And so this goes back and forth and that's a lasting issue in, in the uh, atheist um, you know, worldview and lexicon. They have other, in the ancient Greeks offered moral critiques of theists, right? Look, these aren't the greatest people in the world. These people claiming to be oh, high and mighty and pious, you know, that sort of thing. And that persists too. You have the interesting phenomenon of the plausible denial of your own unbelief with artists. So you get some of the ancient playwrights, right? Aristophanes, Euripides, others, lesser names, who wrote very trenchant criticisms, put them in the, to the mouths of characters in their plays, right? A character saying, you don't have to believe this ancient nonsense and these gods, it's things like that. And other things that are very mocking that would lead you to wonder if the playwright himself was a religious skeptic, but the loophole for the playwright is to say, that's not my idea. Those are just ideas I put into a mouth of a, the mouth of a character I invented. That's not me, right? So that little stratagem, <laughs> that reappears too, right? Voltaire could write things uh, and do something like that, you know, like, I, that was just a character I wrote. That's not, that's not my ideas or something, something to that effect. And another feature of ancient atheism is satire, which is a little bit in this writing, but, and, and a kind of tenor of mocking, a mocking tenor toward the atheist. And that's, that's still around, right? This, this sort of, um, it, it's, a, it's a testiness toward the theist in a kind of mocking tenor. And I think that might come from, if, think about it psychologically, from the fact of a minority, which would be the unbelievers in any age, a minority thinking they know that the majority is wrong. The majority is very deceived on this. And that brings a kind of you know, almost resentment toward the majority in, in this kind of mocking tone. Anyway, so we get the Greeks and the Romans and this literature is afoot uh, in the ancient world, right? And the Romans get it and they're, they are capable of reading the Greeks. And then what happens? Then Christianity happens, right? With the ascendancy of Christianity, and what Christianity is going to do is it's going to put an emphasis on belief, right? On, on, you have to have the proper ideas, orthodox, the right views, right? And they're going to be started becoming intolerant for any kind of dissent. So 300 years after Jesus, you get, uh, I think, one of the children of Constantine, Theodosius I, the Roman emperor. Christianity is now the religion of the empire. And they, they, they identify it as such. And they start having this slight bias toward the ancient religion, right? And the, the writers, the ancient philosophers, the Greek and the Roman philosophers. A hundred years later, 400 years later, after, uh, 400 years after Jesus, you get Emperor Theodosius II. And this is when the laws emerge. This is when laws emerge opposed to heresy, right? Having the wrong ideas about Jesus opposed to apostasy, leaving the true faith, right? Laws of forbidding public debates on religion in the public forum, right? This is when they start destroying the so-called pagan, a word that they invented, 
a pejorative word the Christians invented against the ancient religion. They started destroying the temples right, of, the, of the Romans, Roman gods. They started destroying the temples and forbidding that kind of worship by pain of death. They started at that time to suppress the philosophical writings of the Greeks and the Romans, and especially the skeptical stuff. So this stuff becomes suppressed. A lot of the ancient classical writing was lost. Most of it was lost because it was left to the Christians in the scriptoriums, scriptoriums of the monasteries where they're copying this stuff, right? The only reason we have Aristotle is they did this. So they copied some, but they did not copy most. So they leave most of it just to die and to wither away, but they copy some, but they have them in these scriptoriums. They're not available for public consumption. And so what happens is, is essentially for a thousand years in Europe, right? There is no skeptical reading and no skeptical writing, right? It's not to say there weren't skeptics. There almost certainly were skeptics, right? Or even the fact that Christianity is coming through, right, and making converts of everyone, but how deeply, right? This could be a patina of Christianity over trowels and trowels of, you know, paganism, belief in multiple gods or all kinds of superstition or skepticism. But the point is, is there's no, these books of, of the classical antiquity are not available. They're not made available to the intellectuals and there's no writing for a thousand years, okay? But it comes back, it comes back after a thousand years and it's, step, it's incrementally, and I wanna go through century by century in this sort of low fly over this, to let you know how this, this resuscitation of the ancient atheism or the ancient religious skepticism comes back to the West. So I would start with the 1300s. In the 1300s, and this is gonna be by degrees we're working toward, 1300s in European universities, we're talking Oxford and Cambridge, University of Paris, University of Bologna, uh, Pisa. These universities had been around since the 1100s. Right, so this is the 1300s. The curriculum at the universities is something called education by disputation. It was based on ideas of Aristotle from antiquity, meaning education by disputation is learning to argue your points, learning to argue a case against the very best arguments against your case. And if there are no arguments against your case, invent them and answer them. So the professors in the universities are dreaming up the best arguments they can think of against God and against Christianity, exposing their students to it, and then they're all trying to refute these arguments. Well, what do you think happened? What do you think happened when you introduce you know, powerful arguments against God or against Christianity to a bunch of young people. Some of them are gonna say, I think the arguments against God are better than our, our defenses. So it's a little way in, back in, where it's starting to resuscitate, 1300s. 1400s, the Renaissance begins. And the Renaissance is, the word means rebirth, the rebirth of classical, world, the classical world, Greeks and the Romans, in, in art and architecture, but also in the writings. And so the works start to come out of the scriptoriums and the intellectuals are getting their hands on this stuff I just told you about five minutes ago, these ancient Greek and Roman writers, the skeptical writing too, and that starts circulating in the 1400s. By the 1500s, you get in Italy and in France, you get certain writers um, Pomp uh, Pompanazzi and, and Cardano and others, right? Um, they're exposed to these ancient classics of the Romans and the Greek, the skeptical writings, and they start writing books, skeptical of, Im of immortality, skeptical of various aspects of 
the worldview of theism at that time. So it starts in Italy, in France, in this, these little ways in the 1500s. Not a full-fledged atheism though, but skeptical on certain points that are affiliated with theism. Also in the 1500s, as you know, you get the Protestant Reformation, which mostly affects Northern Europe, but it breaks up the hegemony of Catholicism in Europe and it creates the space for religious dissent, for the permissibility of religious dissent, right? Because before that, religious dissent was punished, possibly even by execution, right? You could get burned to cinders if you had the wrong beliefs, right? But Luther breaks away. He was called a heretic. They wanted to kill him. They couldn't get their hands on him. And the Reformation, in some weird way, especially what's called the Radical Reformation, with so many different Protestant sects, S-E-C-T-S, it creates a little space for religious dissent. What was formerly just condemned as heresy, now you have all these different sects. And so the space for religious dissent is a little space for the skeptic to get in there at some point later on. In the 1600s, there's all kind of books appearing against atheism. Meanwhile, there's no atheistic books. But there's all these books written against atheism, defending theism. It must be that the intellectuals who are writing these books against atheism have experienced it in their, in their dealings with people, with their fellow intellectual class, right? It, it's a foot, right? And so they're writing against it, even though there are no atheistic books per se, right? Um, also in the 1600s, deism emerges. So deism, as you know, and from the, from the Latin word Deus, God. So a belief in God, but not a belief in anything about Christianity or Judaism or any sort of revealed religion, right? There's no re revelation, right? So denying really every syllable of Christianity eventually, but still ticking, sticking to the notion that we, well, we have to believe in God because Somebody had to create this whole thing. There is a God, but they start these writings, the deists. They're part of this story of the reemergence of atheism in Europe because they have critiqued, they will critique every bit of Christianity in their writings, even while they're protecting the idea of God. So they have ideational critiques against Christianity and moral critiques too. Um, you know, saying certain ideas in the Christian system are immoral, right? Um, the, the notion of revelation itself, that, that there's a God who gives, divulges information to a small group of people, leaving the rest of the planet in ignorance and going head first, heels kicking into hell. Immoral, right? So they're offering these critiques. The deists are part of it, and that persists through the 18th century. It begins in the 1600s, the 17th century. In the 1700s, the 18th century, we get the Enlightenment, as everybody knows. There's a word in every language in Europe for this phenomenon, what we call the Enlightenment. This burst of knowledge and creativity that happened in the 1700s, and it's in the 1700s, that openly avowed atheism appears in modern Europe, it reappears since ancient times, right? But it happens here even here by degrees, right? little degrees. And here are the degrees, how it, how it happened. Somebody might publish anonymously. So anonymity becomes one of the steps toward avowed. You're, you're writing anonymously. You're not publicly avowing atheism yourself. You're circulating a book by anonymous and it's got all the critiques in it, right? Anonymity is one of these steps. Pseudonymity is one of these steps publish a book under a fake name. There are people doing that. They're atheistic books, critiquing Christianity, critiquing the idea of God. There are people who are writing between the lines in certain ways. They might be writing even for the church or about God, but between the lines, you're almost detecting, you can detect this sort of skeptical attitude. You're, you have people using escape clauses. So they're exposing the reader to all kinds of critical ideas. 
and then saying, well, as a Christian, of course, I oppose all of these. Or saying, if I weren't a Christian, I would say this, right? If I were not a Christian, I would say this, and then you offer the, the devastating critique of the Christian idea, you know? But I'm a Christian, I'm not the kind of person who would say that. But if I was not a Christian, that's what I would say. So that kind of thing, you have the phenomenon of dialogues, which is used in antiquity too. You create characters who talk to each other. And in the, in the mouth of one of the characters or more, you can put these very critical ideas, the atheistic ideas, while the author himself says, these are not my ideas. That's just a character in a dialogue that I put, up, put out there, right? You have a phenomenon called the feeble defense, which is you publish a book purporting to defend God in the face of atheism. Meanwhile, you're exposing the, the reader to many critiques of God, and you're offering a feeble defense of theism. You, it becomes obvious to the reader that you have presented a book <laughs> where the case against God is stronger than your supposed case for God. People actually got prosecuted for this. People got prosecuted for feeble defense. It was risky to put out a book defending theism. And then it appears that the, the, the atheist in the argument has the upper hand. That was a very risky thing to do. You also have in the 18th century more of these deistic writings, which are not atheistic, right? But they're offering these trenchant critiques, as I said, of Christianity and famously Thomas Paine, right? whose book, The Age of Reason, probably made more atheist than any other book in that, in that century or maybe the next century too. It's a, a very powerful critique of Christianity of which he got into big trouble for, but he was a theist. He believed in God. He just did not believe in Christianity. He spoke of the Christian mythology, the Christian mythologist, and if you haven't read that book, you should read that book for historical interest. There's Voltaire, too, in this century. Nobody more famous in Europe. He's, he hates Christianity. He's writing against Christianity, but he believes in God. Finally, mid-century or maybe later in the 18th century, you get avowed atheism again. You get a person in their own name publishing against God, right? In France, in England, in France, um, Baron Dolbach, right? In the System of Nature, and another book of his called, uh, um, oh, I forget the name of it. So, avowed, avowedly atheistic in England, and you can get this pamphlet, you should read it. It's a, a guy named Matthew Turner wrote this little pamphlet called An Answer to Dr. Presleep. So, so and he says, you know, you say there's no atheist in London. I'm telling you, I am one. And he writes this very eloquent, you know, defense of his lack of belief. So it shows up, avowed atheism shows up in the 18th century. The other thing that shows up in the 18th century, this new nomenclature in free thought literature, which is all sort of anti-religious, free thought literature emerges here and scores of books start appearing against Christianity in the free thought literature. When we get to the 1800s, you have this growing free thought literature. When I started reading in this, because you, you're never taught this stuff in the schools, in the graduate schools, if you're studying the history of religion, you're never taught this stuff. You have to go find it and it's vast. You know, Jason said, you're part of a, a long and impressive history, it's true. It's, it's a vast literature of unbelief. And you start finding all these names and just tracking down these things. And nowadays at Amazon, you can get these books that were written hundreds of years ago, facsimiles of them, just sent to your doorstep in two days, you know, the, um, a copy of the very thing. So you have this growing literature in the 1800s. You have also sort of popular magazines appearing that are wholly devoted to free thought or wholly devoted to anti-religion. Popular magazines like that, if you can imagine such a thing, you have organizations arising like this organization you're in, but others, free thought organizations, secular organizations and so on, 
many people in, in England, right, in, play in Holland and, you know, getting together as groups of unbelievers in these organizations. You have in the 1800s, so this goes back incrementally for hundreds of years to the process of secularization occurring, right? Secularization, um, the diminishing role of religion in every part of public life, right? So secularization is diminishing, right? You had, um, you know, from the 1700s, you have the separation of church and state in the American and French constitutions, right? So this limited role, it's, religion starts to take a little bit of a back seat in the secularization process. In education, it's not gonna be priests and nuns teaching anymore. There's gonna be a professional class of teachers teaching, right? The, the secularization of laws, many of the laws are gonna disappear, the blasphemy laws, the laws against, um, you know, even uh, abortion, laws against, you know, the things that were attached to Christian morality, the secularization process is going to start dissolving this in the 19th century. And all along too, and I mentioned the 19th century science, but since Galileo and Newton back in the, in the um, 1600s, um, the 17th century, though they were theists, Galileo and Newton, but the effects of their science start leading people you know, away from the theistic interpretation of the natural world. Darwin in the 19th century, although he, he by degrees, he lost his faith. When he took that, that trip on the boat, the, uh, the, um, the HMS Beagle in his 20s, he was a believer. When he's writing that book, you know, The, the Voyage of the Beagle, and he's writing what he saw. He spent five years on that boat, going to South America, going various places. You can see the germ of what will be his, his famous ideas later, natural selection. You know, when he's writing this journal, writing this book, but he was still a believer. And he lost his faith in this process of his science. And that's part of the story too, as we know, right? In the 1800s, we get the new term agnosticism. Uh, Huxley invents this term. Right, so these words, as you know, right, are, you know, theism is, is Greek for theos is God. In Greek, the language a, the prefix a is a negation of the word, a theism, not theist. A Gnostic is not knowing. So he invents this term. Really, it's pretty clear that he wanted a softer term. He wanted a softer term. Atheism, the word had already been tainted by the theist, right, morally tainted. So people wanted this other word agnostic, but it's really a species of unbelief. The agnostic isn't any kind of believer in God, right? So you, but you have that phenomenon occurring. In the 1900s, the 20th century, you get growing secularization in Europe. They start in the 19th century, they start taking um, surveys of church attendance in Europe. And so for a hundred years and into, into the 20th century, it's just steady decline. It never goes back up. It never has. It's year after year decline in church attendance, which is not necessarily atheism, but it shows the diminishing role of religion, the secularization of the society. Um, you get a vast falling away uh, from religion and from God in the 20th century. I mean, many of us here, we lived in the 60s. The 60s are going to, the 1960s are going to be remembered just like we categorize the Renaissance or the Enlightenment or the, or the, uh, the, you know, the scientific age or the industrial age. There's going to be a name for what happened in the 60s in the West. It's a vast falling off. There's a book by a scholar named Hugh McLeod, something like um, The Religious Crisis of the 1960s. He's a British scholar. And it's a pretty good book to read to see what's going on there. You know, the, the rapidity of, of the secularization of Europe. So that by, at some point in the 20th century, the majority of the intellectual class of Europe, right? These are the people, the thinkers, right? The, the novelists, the, the PhDs, the scientists, the majority are no longer religious or believers. Now, if you want to say, well, what, what do you mean majority, 60%, 70%? It depends on the, on the discipline, but I've been around PhDs for decades, and informally, anecdotally, 
most of them are not believers or religious, um, which is an interesting thing. It's, it's, you have to ask, how did that happen? Because for a thousand years prior, the smartest people in Europe believed in God, be they Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, right? Maybe not 100%, but close to it, they believed in God. And now you have in 100 or 150 years, you have many of the smartest people not believing in God. What happened, right? The, the, the scientists that are inducted into their nation's academies of science, those kind of people, the Nobel laureates, right? Not all of them, but most of them. Um, we can't forget in the 20th century, the communist fiat against religion in the various communist countries, right? Just shutting down religion. In some places, it quote worked. Like the Czech Republic is one of the most secular places in the world, right? In some places, you know, after 1989, when the Soviet Union fell, you know, religion came back to Russia. It came back, you know, in other places. But in other places, it's just gone for good. But there was that period where the communists are trying to suppress religion by fiat, right? So that's part of the story. Another thing I want to mention that begins in the 1800s but 1900s is the role of liberal religion in this process because the liberal theologians, whether Jewish or Christian, and there are now Islamic liberal theologians. There's a book this thick, holding up my fingers to about an inch, called Liberal Islam. And the liberal theologians recast God almost in answer to the atheistic critique, right? But they recast God and they recast everything in the lexicon of their religion in a modern context to make it more credible to a thinking person. So the liberal, so you said the liberal, um, or said the liberal says, the, Christ, the liberal Christian, do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Certainly I do. But let me tell you what I mean by that, right? And then you hear something you never heard before in your life. It's a reinterpretation of the term. Do you believe in hell? Certainly I believe in hell, but let me tell you what I mean by that, right? Do you believe in God? Certainly I believe in God. Let me tell you what I mean by that though. And then there, there, there's this totally revisioning, revisionist theology it's called too. But that becomes actually part of the problem because it becomes a little stepping stone toward unbelief. So you have the strict believer, they move left, if you will, to liberal religion, and then it's easy for them to take the path right out of religion. That's part of the story. When we get to our century, the 21st, you get more falling away, more secularization. This is being studied and noticed you know, with every passing year. Jason mentioned this at the beginning of, of the day. And it's happening now in America too. So America was always the outlier, right? So you have the, the secular, I mean, you have the democracies, the wealthy democracies of the world are, you know, just, they're, they're not that religious, right? But America was this very religious country and wealthy and all of that. So it became, the question was, what's the deal here? You know, and there are various theories about that. But one might be simply that it's some decades behind Europe, right? That it's happening now. The young people now, the kids in high school, the freshmen at college, there's more of them that are unbelievers. There's a lot of them. Is, it, is religion important in your life? No, it's not, right? So some say this is the least religious group of young people that America has ever seen. I, I don't know if I, I believe that. I think that there were, there were irreligious people all through the history of America. Uh, their stories weren't told though. And you have, as we heard, the new atheists, the books that in the beginning of this century in the first decade hit the bestseller list. But keep in mind, Dawkins and Dennett and the rest, Christopher Hitchens, they didn't create that readership. That readership existed. It was there. They, they were just looking for something to read, right? The unbelievers were there. They didn't create the unbelievers, right? The unbelievers were there. They wanted something to read. And so they hurled these books up the bestseller lists. But, um, but nonetheless, a new atheist, new atheist I, again, I don't, it was the journalist term, right? Everything about the new atheist is old, really. I mean, even if you say their tone, 
that sort of mocking tone, no, that's ancient too. And by the way, have you ever read Nietzsche? Extremely offensive, right, against the Christians, that sort of thing. So it's not new. And there's one other thing about our century, a different turn in this. What I aspy and I call religious indifference. It's a new, it's a new thing. It's a religious, they're not theists, they're not believers, but they're wholly indifferent to religion. I see this among, you know, PhDs I know. So if I were to just ask, just out of curiosity to some PhD, international reputation, whatever the field is, you believe in God? No, I don't believe in God. Would you be willing to write up 500 words to say why you don't? I would not be willing to do that. I'm not gonna write 500 words, just like I'm not gonna write 500 words about why I disbelieve that a unicorn exists. It's unbelievable on the face of it. So that's a different kind of attitude. The, the atheists of the past, in antiquity in the past few hundred years has been kind of engaged in the argument. An atheist is kind of still in the game. And there's a new kind of unbelief that is completely indifferent to religion. One of the Nobel laureates in physics, the guy from the University of Texas, what's his name? Werberg, or I forget his name. But in some interview, he said, look, among my friends, scientists, you know, high level scientists, he said, we don't even rise to the level of calling ourselves atheists because we're so indifferent to religion, right? An atheist is kind of still in the game and wants to argue about this stuff. I don't want to talk about it. Let's move on, that kind of thing. So that's, <laughs> that's out there too. That phenomenon is out there. So this is the way I want to end this. I want to just say, so the atheists, and you, you guys know the many critiques. There's many, many, many stuff. And by the way, this the writing from the 19th century and before is completely, the atheistic writing, the skeptical writing is beautiful writing. Very, the stylists, it's amazing. It's far better than the new atheists, than anything I've ever read in our current century. The writing, just the way that they think, it's just brilliant. You know, you, and you've got to find this stuff because it's not there, though I'm going to mention some anthologies here in a minute. So let me, let me tell you, so here's a problem. In the 19th century, some of the 19th century atheists like Feuerbach and others thought about this. So say the atheists, say they believe the, the, the God idea is wrong, okay? Doesn't the atheist have to explain the persistence of an error like that? How can you get so many people involved in a delusion for so many thousands of years, right? And so the, the answers come. They come in the 19th century first, like Short, uh, Schopenhauer. He said at one point, he said a few things, but he said it's the indoctrination of children. That's how religions succeed. Nobody waits till you're 20. And when you're 20, we're going to bring in 500 speakers, 500 different religions, and you decide, right? They don't do that. They indoctrinate children, have absolutely no critical abilities. Whatever they're told, they'll believe it for decades, right? So he's, he says that, and it's different where, wherever you are on the planet, right? You, you were utterly convinced if you were born in Cambodia, you would be a convinced Buddhist, period. But you were born in Minnesota, so you are a convinced Lutheran Protestant, right? That sort of thing. He talks about that too, the role of that geography is fate where religion is concerned. Right? Where are you from? Well, I'm from Peru. Are you Catholic? Yeah, how did you know that? That's crazy. How could you know a thing like that? Tell me what my religion is. Well, where are you from? I'm from Mumbai. Are you Hindu? I got chills on the back of my neck. What are you, psychic? You know, that sort of thing. It even works in America. Are you from Arkansas? Are you from Little Rock? Are you Southern Baptist? That's crazy. How would you know a thing like that? So these kind of things are the media for the persistence of religion. They, you know, and Schopenhauer talks about religion offering the myth for the masses, right? This mythos, it's, it's something that the masses, he's very <laughs> elitist, Schopenhauer. 
I don't need this stuff, but I understand how the hoi polloi need it to get through life. It makes life meaningful. He talks about that. Marx comes along and says it's solace, right? It's solace for the difficulties of life. We didn't get, we were raised in the Cold War. We didn't get the full quote, y'all. When it said, uh, religion is the opening of the people. The full quote is very tender and very sympathetic from Karl Marx, right? He says, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature. It's the heart of a heartless world, right? It's the opium of the people, meaning it dulls their pain. And then he goes on to say, you know, give them, but real life here, you know, like if you increase justice and wealth, you don't have to attack religion. It will die on its own. There's some truth to that because the wealthy nations is where we see the high instance of atheism. Right? Japan, Europe, Scandinavian countries, which are the most successful, the safest, um, they're voted the happiest places to live on earth every year, and they're the most secular countries in the world. Um, but you, in the most religious countries are where there's a lot of desperation, right? So that the notion of solace, right? There, and the psychologists come into the story, right? Um, Feuerbach with projection, Freud coming in and saying the persistence of religion is this desire, this deep wish for the providential care of a God, of a father God. The, the daddy God who's going to look after us and help us. He's not going to let us mess this thing, that sort of thing. Um, so there's things like that. There's, there's like the persistence of the error. Is it ever going to end? Will the error end? And that's when you get into futurism and guesses. Like what is the next 30,000 years going to bring? You know, what is the next 30,000? We know what happened 30,000 years ago with the Cro-Magnon peoples. And we've come a little way since then. What does the next 30,000 years look like? Are any of these religions going to be here in 30,000 years? Right? Wasn't it, uh, who was it? Um, was it Emerson who said, the religion of one era is the literary entertainment of the next. Right? They called it religion. We call it mythology. And read it as such and enjoy it as mythology. Is that the future of this? What is the future um, of atheism? Is time on the atheist side, as it were? Just give it time. This thing is going to play itself out. Freud called religion the chief neurosis of the infancy of humanity. With the idea, with the infancy, Humanity will outgrow it. You only need a pacifier so long. Anyway, I can quit right there if we need to. I was going to mention some books, some anthologies, but Jason can send this stuff out later. Oh, well, everyone, please unmute yourselves and give a warm yeah. San Diego round of applause to San Diego. Oh, we can. Thank Good. you. Thanks, Rab. Uh, hey, Joseph, is it possible that we could get like a reading list from some of those great uh, yes. in the 1800s and 1700s? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Allow yeah. me really quick some some great books, and I'm sure that Joe would bring these up. Yeah, that's that's a good one. From I'll pull, it back, pull it back just a little bit so we can see. Yeah, hold it up again. So these are these are primary sources from antiquity to the 20th century, and the, the, the editor, Paul Edwards, who's written some other great books, he has these great introductions to each chapter, but what he's chosen to read is, is very good. So that's it. That was the top one on my little, you know, the, the, one, the stack of books I have here. That was the, and that's another one I have there by Joshi. Move your fingers there. So this guy, Joshi, put together a reader and he has another one on agnosticism, by the way, agnosticism, a reader, and he collects. And that's another one right there. That's the Gordon Stein one, right? That's a, and he has two volumes of that, atheism and rationalism. Mm -hmm. and, and Jason can, you know, circulate these. There's two volumes of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's, there's a ton. Um, yeah. Joe, oh, Joe yeah. teaches several classes. 
I mean, Hitchens had Hitchens had one too, a collection too. Portable atheists. Don't, don't forget this, y'all. This is what we're talking about: women in this movement. You got to get look how thick this book is. This is called "Women Without Superstition: No Gods, No Masters," edited by uh, Annie Laurie Gaylor. You have that too. I this don't. Is, this is a this is a great book to read because you have to get the women in on this, and some of this stuff is extremely eloquent, mm -hmm. beautifully written. And then don't forget this one. Oh yeah. This is the one you were mentioning and how, how you were mentioning how the style of writing was more elegant back then. Just a quick quote from this particular book that was published 201 years ago in 1819. And here is how relevant this material is to today from Baron Dolbach, also known as um, Paul Henri Thierry, the Baron Dolbeck. He was one of those French Prussian intellectuals who ran one of the old salons where people would go and they would drink and they would discuss. And in this particular book, listen to this quote from this book and think about its relevance to today. It is necessary then to carefully distinguish Christian morality from political morality. The former makes saints, the latter citizens. One makes men useless or even hurtful to the world. The other has for its object the formation of members useful to society, men active and vigorous who are capable of serving it, who fulfill the duties of husbands, fathers, friends, and companions, whatever may be their metaphysical opinions, which let the theologists say what they will, are much less sure than the invariable rules of good sense. Oh, bad. Wow. Yeah. And then two other books I want to bring up, actually three real quick. And a great gift, a great gift from a good friend from a couple of years ago. Yeah, he taught at uh, Princeton for a long time, Walter Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, this one, if you want to go even deeper than those other anthologies, John McKinnon Robertson, A Short oh. History of Free Thought, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. So that's one of the true geniuses and one of the most brilliant writers of this whole, the free thought stuff. He's in the 19th century, comes into the 20th, and he writes uh, that ancient, the history of free thought from antiquity to the present. But another book in two volumes is a history of free thought in the 19th century alone. And that's good. But all of his books are worth reading. They're really good writing. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no, it's, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And also from the, the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States, so many people were publishing little local atheist newspapers. And there was a term that was applied to them. And from Princeton University Press from a couple of years ago, fantastic book, Village Atheists. <laughs> yeah. Two other, two other quick ones from, from Joe Syllabi from his secularism course, he brought up religious crises of the 1960s, religious crisis of the 1960s. And lastly, from a Scottish sociologist, and you have to read this book, it's fantastic. This is, this is the new book chat here on humanism today. <laughs> but Steve Bruce's God is Dead, Secularism in the West, Secularization in the West. Notice, notice the photograph, put the photograph back, back up. What's on the cover? That's a church that is now a carpet store. Okay. So that's a thing that's happening in Europe. You have 500 year old churches that are now, you know, Oriental rug stores, Italian restaurants, loft apartments, bookstores, things like that. So that's a little indicator. You know, Has anybody um, made one of brothel yet? <laughs> <laughs> there has been some sort of lunatic millionaire who bought one, made it into his residence, and put his king size bed where the altar used to be. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> Even I bed. think that's too much. Oh man! Stained <laughs> glass windows all around. It's very striking. So, do we have any questions? I have a question. Or comments, because uh, I know that you guys know much of this stuff okay yeah um is is there is it is it right to draw a parallel between the ancient greeks who began to, when they were starting to offer um naturalistic 
explanations for phenomena, and then they continued into naturalistic explanations for religion itself. Is there a pal parallel between that and when the uh, the people modern, uh, like even today, modern atheists talking about psychological and sociological explanations for the persistence of the error of uh, belief in God? Absolutely. And Others here in the group can speak to that too. But that's what's happened in the social sciences. So the social sciences and anthropology and sociology, psychology, you know, they offer very credible explanations for the emergence of religion and the persistence of it. Yeah. And the very latest thing is cognitive science, which looks at, you know, how, how is it that the brain, the architecture of the brain produced religion or the susceptibility to religion or the attraction to religion, and they have, there's, that's a very new field. There's a lot of theories about that. It's, it's very interesting what they say about, they, they call it, you know, I don't know if you read the New York Times article some years ago that religion was a mistake. It was an accident. It was a byproduct, something gone awry, right? The, the, the um, agency detection in early humans, yeah. agency detection, right? Is that an agent? Is that a boulder or is that a bear? Right. Is that an agent, right? Which is a necessary, you have to have that to survive. But it went haywire, it started seeing agents everywhere, invisible agents. And the second part of that agency detection was mind reading. Is that bear, is, he, is that crouching tiger coming after me and my kid? Or is he just so you're trying to read the mind? And so they say that's filled over to create innumerable invisible entities where you're trying to, humans are trying to imagine what these invisible entities are thinking about us. Yeah. And propitiation and, and worship coming from, you know, like trying to calm these invisible entities down, keep them on your side. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. I was gonna mention that and I didn't get around to it. Yeah. Is that, uh, I've heard my, Michael Shermer speak about that, especially about agency and category one and two errors. <laughs> Yeah. But you know, you have to say that. So, in, in some sense, I don't know about this. Somebody in the audience here can say this, but for religion to persist in terms of natural selection, it had to be adaptable, right? It had to be in some way helping the species along. Maybe it was in group cohesion. Like we all have these same beliefs that we share. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't it have to be like we want to like that one theory is like this was an accident but does natural selection permit accidents you know for the ultimate success of the species yeah that's a yeah. question i'm not saying i i don't know if i know the answer to but well, there's, there's, a, there's a book there's a book that addresses that the faith instinct by nicholas wade which uh looks at how religion evolved that uh, i can recommend people to take a look at he was a science writer for the New York Times, very interesting book, I thought. The Faith yeah. Instinct? The, the Faith Instinct by Nicholas Wade. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one other point I wanted to make, uh, people are interested in the future of religion. There's really good material at the Pew Research Center on that. And uh, a couple of tidbits, for example, uh, there's a, the net change from 2010 to 2050 in one of their projections uh, between switching in and out of unaffiliated and Christians, uh, it's about, uh, they project about 66 million switching out of Christianity and 61 million uh, switching into unaffiliated. But on the negative side is the, uh, uh, the reproduction rate, <laughs> which turns out to be much greater for uh, uh, Islam uh, than for Christianity, and Christianity much greater than uh, atheist. Atheist reproduction rate, I think, was 1.6. You need 2.0 to uh, to stay even. <clears throat> yeah, I've heard about things like that. Um, but keep in mind, too, <clears throat> there have been numer innumerable, I mean, maybe thousands of religions that have died out in human history that met historical cul-de-sacs. I mean, some of those lasted for thousands of years and then just fell with the civilization. Um, so 
if the future is, you know, in some ways unimaginable, I mean, what we can imagine may very well happen, and the rest is unimaginable. Well, in some cases, it's very predictable that the shakers would, would end. There are not a zero. Reproduction rate is zero. They, they yeah. believe in celibacy. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Epicureans, I love the, the Epicureans when I go back and look at ancient history, and they ended, but, but they, they weren't really into reproduction either. They, that, wasn't, that wasn't a big thing for them. Uh, but the Christians, uh, Catholics in particular, really emphasize that. Well, Christianity is the largest re religion in the world. It is. <clears throat> and, you know, that Catholicism has a billion members or more. It's just a reflection of the Southern Hemisphere, right, where, you know, there's a lot of Catholics who have a lot of babies. <clears throat> also, draw drawing uh, conclusions about the future by just looking at birth rate of different uh, groups of, of religions is assuming that that's how people are always going to either be or not be in a religion. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a valid way of predicting it anymore. Well, I would agree with that. The intellectual environment has changed so much that religion is no longer a, a well adaptive trait. It's it's going extinct because the, the environment has changed. Well, if, if, if you look at the data, the switching rate is, mm -hmm. is so much lower than the, the difference in, in switching rate is so much lower mm -hmm. in total than the difference in reproduction rate that yeah. at least up to now, yeah, uh, the trends it, are definitely the trends are, are toward, in fact, Islam is expected to uh, be the largest in religion in beginning in 2070, according to Pew. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's going to change along the way. Hopefully. So Dave Wright has a question. With Richard. <laughs> What's that? I would yeah. concur with you that things are going to change. Um, there is so much more entropy in the world uh, today than there was a hundred years ago, simply with, uh, if nothing else, technological developments, mm -hmm. um, but also so much more migration across the globe where you're going to have uh, the intersection of cultures like you absolutely have not at a volume that you have never had before. Yeah. Those are huge dynamics and there are lots of other ones as well. So, um, so the dynamism is only growing. Yeah. All right. So Dave Price has a question. Dave. Yeah, I, I did. Um, uh, thanks so much for that discussion. That was really um, helpful, useful information. And I was particularly interested in your comment um, about you know, your observation that most of your fellow faculty, most PhDs, you know, um, et cetera, are not religious, would, wouldn't, you know, they basically call themselves atheists. What I'm interested in is, are they also identifying as humanists, would you say? And if not, what do you think is holding that back? And what sort of preventing um, the stronger advocacy for humanism which, as you pointed out, you know, atheism is just a lack of belief. It doesn't really uh, promote any values. Humanism is a set of values that I think we, you know, we can all feel good about. What do you think's, what do you think's happening there? I don't think they know about it that much. I think in, in practice, they are humanists because they do have these values and they live a certain way and they have very high standards of morality in their way, right? And what, you know, in their sociology, their politics, their family life and stuff like that. Yep. But there's also a, biz, a part of this is not wanting to belong to anything, right? Not wanting to belong, like to not wanting, wanting to join something that's like a religious organization that has something like that. I think that's a bit of it too. Um, you know, to, to ask these people, you know, who are pretty busy anyway, you want to belong to a humanist group, we're going to meet once a whatever, you know, they may not want to do that. So I think they don't know that much about it, right? even though they're living it. They're basically kind of living the humanistic values. Right. And they don't, I don't think they know about it. Nobody's, right. people haven't walked up to them with a pamphlet, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that I think that you know um, humanism lacks marketing. You know, good marketing, 
yeah. um, as a movement. <clears throat> but it also seems to us that have been working in this Southern California coalition, if you will, that there is a, a fairly strong need for um, people to get together with like-minded folks and the need for community. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious, do you, I mean, I, I understand that university professors may be a, a little bit of a different breed on that perhaps, and, and maybe don't have that same need, but it would seem like most folks, you know, would like to. So is, or basically what I'm hearing you say is they just don't know that much about it. It's probably more of a marketing issue than anything. Um, probably. I remember there was, there was one professor here, um, who was into the, you know, the backyard skeptics, mm -hmm. yep. which I never went to one of those, but, um, yeah. he was, he went to one somewhere in Orange County and yep. he did want to, he wanted to be around, um, and he was, you know, he's an interesting case because he was never religious, but he was very interested in religion. Mm -hmm. He's not a believer. In, he's an atheist. He has no animus against religion. You know, it's interesting to meet people, some people who, people who have left religion feel stung by it and feel a certain animus against it. Right. A little bit of venom. Some people that are not raised with it don't have any particular emotions attached, but they're curious about it. So, you know, I don't know. There's some psychology involved in this. There's, there's marketing. I think there's a lot of that not wanting to belong. Uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, Kathleen Madigan, says the best way to ensure that your kids don't join ISIS is send them to Catholic school. So by the time they get out of Catholic school, if somebody comes up to them and say, hey, can we talk to you about our God? They'll go, no, I've had enough of that. <laughs> hey, um. All right. So Dick has Dick, a question. Dick, Dick, Dick. What's that? Um, <laughs> and, oh, so, I said, oh, oh, I said, oh, Oh, we're getting an echo feedback. Yeah, so uh, Dr. McKenna, uh, so we have this um, stereotypical uh, Catholic or Christian adolescent who's uh, 12 years old and he's, he's, a strong, he's a total believer because it's been rammed into his head. A few years later, he's, uh, he's in his late teens and he's become very skeptical, very skeptical. A few years later, he's sitting in a foxhole in Afghanistan. He's praying like crazy. A few years later, he's out on the street having a hard time. So he decides to rob a bank and shoot a security guard. And a few years later, he's in a maximum security prison and he belongs to the Bible club. Now, what can you make out of that person? Well, I mean, <clears throat> maybe it's maybe it's predictable in a way. I mean, it's, I think that some people, you know, I think sometimes in trauma people, and I don't know about this psychologically, but they revert to these earlier forms of solace, right? I had religion once and it, it worked for me. And so you have these episodes, bad episodes, and you may, you may revert to that. <clears throat> Even some instances of people who are, you know, sort of decades long atheists, sort of in, in their in the latter part of their life, some of them returning to some sort of flavor of the you know religiosity because I mean, it, re it resuscitates some old comfort for them. So I don't know. I mean he I don't know what else is on offer for him in this prison, you know, but prisons do have these groups, these religious groups, you know, that become I mean it's offering them you know, some sort of meaning there, you know, there, is there a humanist group? Is there some other organization that can offer him some meaning, some value, put his life into perspective through some other philosophy? You know, that's, you know, part of it is this is the only thing he's getting exposed to, right? Yeah. Well, I know I've seen several polls where they ask people who, whether they believed in God, and it seemed like the people who are most likely to say yes were convicted criminals in the penitentiaries. And it's an interesting point too, because people think, you know, the idea of hell or the idea of God is a deterrent to this kind of bad behavior. And it's not because the people on death row believe in hell mm -hmm. and it didn't stop them from doing this stuff. Right. Um, they believe in God. 
so it didn't it didn't stop them so um anyway it's an interesting point i wonder you know people that are in that that industry like in the prison industry or 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 um people that are in, across the street i live in this academic neighborhood they built for the faculty right so across the street is the chair of the criminology department you know, do they have theories about this kind of stuff? Uh, what happens in the prisons vis-a-vis -vis religions and, re you know, religiosity of the prisoners? And do, do they welcome it, you know, as a kind of a pacifying effect in the, in the prison? There's something to be noted, and it's, we talked about a bunch of books a little while ago. There's another one written by one of the founders of the Secular Society from Britain. It's called Prisoner for Blasphemy. It's by George William Foote. It came out 100 years ago, 120 years ago. And in it, George William Foote went to prison because he published something blasphemous in his magazine, The Freethinker. He took a, a Danish wood carving of a Bible to show the scene in which Moses saw God's backside. And it was seen that he had done something mocking, despite the fact he had actually used something from the Bible, of a particular Bible itself. And he noted that when they would have services, when they would introduce a new hymn to the prisoners, the prisoners couldn't pick it up. They just couldn't sing it. And even though it was off key, when they did the classical hymns that everyone knew, that were culturally relevant, that everyone learned in Sunday school, et cetera, et cetera. He noted that all of the prisoners knew all of those perfectly. So he said that while Christianity never threw anyone in prison in Britain, it surely never kept anyone out either. Yeah. Ooh. So, so Jason, could you definitely put together that, um, I guess I'll call it a syllabus of uh, yes. reading. I, I try to type as fast as I could, but I'm sure I didn't get it all when you were putting up a bunch of books. I'm very interested in following up on that. Jason, can I also uh, find out where this will be recorded? Because I appreciate all the uh, references or the book, yeah, book <laughs> references in the chat, but also there are a lot of points that Dr. McKenna made, very, very good points that I would like to go through again. Well, Tom, you know what? I am glad that you mentioned that because it's commercial time while, while Dr. McKenna stepped out. Number one, if you like the if you like our events that we're doing, guess what? Within the next couple of weeks, you could see them as they come out on our YouTube channel. Please go to Excellent. our YouTube channel and subscribe. Please watch the videos, like, and subscribe. Most of the videos are an hour and a half long. I clean them up and I put them out, and our longest video is the three-hour one when our indigenous friends Caroline and Kagan stopped by last month. And yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type up the books that were brought up by Dr. McKenna, myself. I'm going to type them up, and then I will link the Google Doc on the description on the video, and we'll make a, an atheist study guide. Back to you, Dr. McKenna. Sounds like a thorough operation you're running there. <laughs> Good luck with it. I'm doing um, the Lord's work. What can I say? Yeah. We need um, to buy one of those abandoned churches. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. There are more and more all the time. <laughs> you should go Google the bookstores uh, in Holland. There's some bookstores that mm -hmm. are former churches. Um, <laughs> quite striking. Yeah, once a nightclub and once at a roller skating rink. Or... Yeah, roller skating rink. Yeah. I, churches oh, actually right. churches perform very useful functions. There's a reason why they've been there for a long time, and yeah. I, and it's churches and church organizations, for example, that go into the prisons, and maybe what we should be doing is moving into the churches with humanist organizations. So what I do is I I go to a uni, Unitarian church in Ventura which is a very hot, large uh, humanist, atheist, humanist community there. And, and socially, it's extremely important to me. Uh, the, I'm uh, coming out of a Christian, well, my parents at least were Christian. You know, I've been dragged to churches for a long time. I don't like the preaching, but the community uh, aspect of it is really useful. And we don't, we don't have something like that. Maybe we can, people need to start thinking about that and the marketing aspect of it. I agree with you, Gary, and uh, and I've been reaching out to a number of the Unitarian churches throughout Orange County. In fact, we've got a, a social justice book club that we're engaged in with uh, three of them right now. 
which is kind of a first step towards that integration, if you will. Um, in addition, the other thing we're really missing in our movement is programs for kids, right? Um, we have very little, or for families, program, you know, um, programs that, that families can really come to and whether it's child care or getting, you know, good education for their kids, that's something also that we need. And you almost need some kind of a uh, structure um, to enable that. Maybe in this, you know, ever evolving Zoom world, we'll figure out a, another way to do it. We do have Camp Quest, of course, and they're trying to expand their activities into after school type programs yeah. in a bunch of different um, areas. And that's important. But yeah, I, I, I'm with you. And, um, you know, we definitely need to be reaching out to uh, our Unitarian Universalist folks because they almost all identify as basically humanist organizations, like to, as, as do the uh, secular Jewish um, groups, by the way. I'd like to Same find business. out more about that and what we might do to link up with that in Ventura County. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Feel free to reach okay. out to me. Yeah. As we're coming upon two hours, do we have any other comments or questions for Dr. McKenna? You know, I remembered a book, um, <clears throat> it's called Religion for Atheists. It's this British, um, what's his name? He's written several really good books. But Religion for Atheists is basically saying the atheists should learn from the religionists in these, these kind of social things, right? Um, you can replicate that sort of thing in the case of the humanist, in the case of the in the case of the atheist gatherings and so on, right? So he just the use of art, the use of you know the the use of space. Um, he talks about other things. The fact that many of these religions have very powerful speakers, right? Um, cultivate speakers in in the in the humanistic world, people who you know really powerful public speakers, that sort of thing. We, we have one. We have one on our call today, which is uh, the the preaching uh, the preaching humanist. Humanist, yeah. There you go. I don't know if he's uh, maybe he had to sign off, but yeah, yeah. He's awesome, uh, David Oliveria out of uh, out of Texas. Jason yeah. had him on uh, uh, a little bit ago, but you're you're exactly right. We need, yeah. definitely need we need more of that. We do have uh, Sunday assembly. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or been to that. Yeah one in LA, one in San Diego, and they're forming. So they've, they've kind of got that sort of format and, um, you know, are, are one of the, one of the I ways was, to, you know, move that forward. I, I was just on um, Amazon and I see um, Religion for Atheists by Alain de Botton. Yeah, it's this very French name, but he's British. Yeah. Okay. Well, I it's it a book worth French speaking at. Yeah, he's excellent. Um, he's really good. He's got a lot of YouTube yeah. videos out there too that are really good on a on a range of, of topics. Well, he he started that school for life. Yes. Yeah. And it has yeah. a lot of good graphics, a lot of good ideas. Yeah. But I've included a um, religion for atheists in a history class, a history of atheism class. You know, and the students kind of end with that, like. You know, and the students get to, you know, argue with that. Think I have that. one other question for you, if I can, real quick, and regarding the students. So one of the organizations that we're promoting quite a bit is called the Secular Student Alliance. They yeah. have chapters, uh, campus chapters, you know, at about 300 different campuses and growing. Um, it's sort of our version of the Christianity Campus Crusade for Christ, you know, it started years ago um, and, 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 and are, are everywhere and well-funded. Um, we're looking to you know try to do something like that at uci i don't know if you're aware of any group like that or not um but if so um or if there's some interest um we'd love to connect and you know see if uh, students might be interested in doing something like that there was something like that it wasn't that organization but there was something like it some years ago it yes it depends on yep. the students who are here at a given time yeah. If, they, if they leave, if they move on, maybe somebody yep. doesn't pick up the ball. But they no, I, was, I was involved with, they were called, they were called Athe AAR, Atheist Agnostics and Rationalists, I believe, at UCI. 
Really? We had a, yeah, and, and we, we uh, yeah, we used to meet regularly. This was years ago, <laughs> 15 years ago. Yeah, well, <laughs> and then you're right, the leaders just sort of left and it sort of dissipated, yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a question about, oh, I have a question about the students since you also teach the, 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 the general educational requirement world religion courses. When, when you're going through teaching general edu when you're teaching this, this overarching view of the different world religions through different themes and, and you're comparing, it's completely pluralistic. How often do you see the students, not necessarily go atheist and including going atheist, change their religious affiliations? I, very often, very often I see them soften in um, whatever they were raised with their beliefs. Because, and it's not anything other than here's the history of this stuff. It's nothing other than that because they've never really been taught the history of this stuff. Here's the history of this stuff. Here's the history of this other religion. And, and so it's just exploding their provincialism. <laughs> kind of leads them out, you know, like, it leads them out uh, into a bigger world and that opens them up to and so yeah you get a lot of students that will you know let's say that just a little course like that will the shifts their thinking but any university course could do a thing like that right but and and it's just it's not even it's just like i say it's just here's the history of this religion these religions and, um, and it's stuff, and I will tell them, you've never heard this. Nobody got up into a pulpit or on a platform and told you this stuff, right? You didn't hear it. Um, you say, oh, well, I went to a Catholic high school. I know all of this stuff. You haven't heard this stuff, right? And so just, it's because they there is a kind of protection, right? If they're gonna tell them something, I give them a kind of, um, protected version of the story but you can you can get into some other things that it make them think you know and then I forced them to think by saying here's a question think about this go to your discussion sections with your TAs and talk about this anyway so yeah good question I I know we all have to roll I really appreciate the offer coming on well we're grateful to have you on and thanks it was great Again, a warm San Diego and Southern California, <laughs> because we have plenty of Southern California leaders and groups here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you awesome. so much. See you all there, Jason. Good.